If we want to think about diatomic molecules in row two, so in other words, lithium two, beryllium two, boron two, carbon two, nitrogen two, oxygen two, fluorine two, we're going to have to think about n equals two orbitals because the valence orbitals, the outermost orbit orbitals for these atoms um, include 2s and 2p orbitals. Remember that our 2s orbital is just spherically symmetric, just like the um, n equals 1 orbital, except that it has um, a radial node somewhere as we're walking out from the nucleus, there's a point in here where the probability goes to zero. So it's, it's larger in size than 1s and it has a radial node. And then if we think about the 2p orbitals, we have a pz orbital, we have a py orbital, and we have a px orbital. So pz, py, and px, they all have this sort of dumbbell shape, um, but they point in different directions. So there are two things that we need to consider when we start thinking about overlap of atomic orbitals, just like we did for the hydrogen um, ion, we need to think about uh, two things. One is the symmetry of those orbitals. How do they combine? Um, how do they overlap when, when they combine with one another? And the second one is the energy of those orbitals. So only orbitals with the right symmetry can um, add together. And only orbitals that are close enough in energy can actually add together. So the energy of the molecular orbital that's formed from the linear combination of the atomic orbitals is a weighted average of the energy of the two orbitals. And so if the orbitals are too far apart, so if we have orbital one and orbital two, and they're too far apart, the weighted average um, is going to end up being very close to one of the orbitals and essentially equal to the, the orbital that contributes the most to that linear combination. And the lower the energy of the orbital, the more it's gonna to contribute to that linear combination. And so this orbital doesn't really mix with, the higher, with orbitals that are very, very high in energy compared to it because the energy gap is too high and that weighted average is essentially just equal to the energy of the lowest orbital. So at least for row two diatomics, the n equals two and the n equals one orbitals are too far apart in energy to mix. And so this means that we only have to consider valence orbitals, n equals two, when we're thinking about um, mixing the atomic orbitals to form the molecular orbitals. So now we need to consider symmetry. So if we think about our 2s orbital, which is spherically symmetric, and has the same, so the wave function has the same sign throughout, so we'll make this one plus, so this is our 2s orbital. And then we think about our um, 2pz orbital, and if we put our nuclear axis the distance between the nuclei along the z axis. So our um, atom one has a 2s orbital here and our atom two, so if we make this A and this B, has a um, nucleus that is at this point, then let's imagine how the pz orbital might overlap with this. And so our pz orbital has electron density in this way. And so we can see that we might be able to add and subtract and get an overlap of the 2s and the 2p orbitals if they're oriented in this direction. 
On the other hand, let's imagine what happens when we have a 2s orbital on atom A and a 2py orbital on atom B. So remember that the wave function for the p orbital has a positive lobe and a negative lobe. And so when we look at the overlap between the s and the py, we can see that we have some positive plus times plus is positive overlap, and we have some negative overlap. So plus times minus is negative. And so this plus overlap is exactly the same as the minus overlap. And so when I add those two things together, the total overlap is zero. And it doesn't matter if I add or subtract these orbitals from one another, I'm going to end up with a zero overlap. And so these py orbitals, and it turns out also the px orbital, if you think about it, have the wrong symmetry to combine. And so these will not form molecular orbitals because there's just zero overlap. And so they can't, there's just the, the um, interference is always destructive and those waves don't add together in any way, shape or form. So if we're thinking about the electron on one of the atoms as being in an s orbital, we can combine s with pz and that will give us um, some a, a bonding molecular orbital, and we can take S minus PZ, and that will give us an anti-bonding molecular orbital. So we have bonding and anti-bonding. And re just if you think about it, you can have both of those have two S both atom A and atom B have um, two S orbitals, and we can either add those together to get a bonding orbital, or we can subtract those just like we did for the one S to get an anti-bonding orbital. So those are several possibilities that we could have for linear combinations of atomic orbitals when we have um, P orbitals that can mix into our, our molecular orbitals. And the PX and the PY cannot combine with the S, However, what happens then if we have atom A and atom B, and we think about both of those as having electrons in um, P orbitals that are oriented either PX or PY. So let's look at those combinations. So if atom A has an electron that's in a PY orbital, and atom B, likewise, has an electron that's in a py orbital. If we put these together such that um, they are adding to each other, then we will get positive overlap in both cases because minus times minus is a plus and plus times plus is a plus. And so we get two positive overlaps, and this forms a bonding situation. If I, on the other hand, subtract the PY, so take the PY on A and subtract the PY on B, then that just flips the signs of the B orbital. And now we can see that we get negative overlap here, and we end up with a node that runs between the two nuclei. Here in this one, we have electron density that um, overlaps. So if we think about the nuclei being here and here, we've got electron density overlapping here and electron density overlapping here. Here, we end up with a zero um, overlap, and so here's our nuclei, and we end up with a node running between those nuclei. So we can add the PY plus PY combination to our bonding orbitals and the PY minus PY combination to our anti-bonding orbitals. 
Likewise, the px plus px will be bonding, and px minus px will be anti-bonding because they're just 90 degrees from the py. Now let's look at what happens when we have pz. pz is oriented along the bond axis. And so when we think about those pz orbitals and how they combine, if we add them together, that is the plus are both up and the minus are down, we're going to end up with negative overlap in between the two nuclei. And so PZ plus PZ will be anti-bonding because we have a node between the two nuclei. Now, if we look at the PZ combination where we subtract PZ from PZ, then we can see that we're going to end up with the negative signs together and the positive signs on, on the outside, and we're gonna have a positive overlap of um, electron density between the two nuclei. And so PZ plus PZ, or minus PZ, will be bonding. As we know, the PZ and the PX and the PZ and the PY, as well as the PX and the PY, are all orthogonal orbitals. And so since they're orthogonal, that means they don't um, overlap with one another. And so they cannot be mixed together. They don't have the right symmetry to mix together um, in order to form molecular orbitals. So let's take a look at all the bonding and anti-bonding combinations that we have um, enumerated so far. And let's look at the symmetry of each of those molecular orbitals. So if we look at the um, 2sA plus 2sB and the 2sA minus 2sB combinations where we're combining 2s orbitals together. When we add them together, we get a spherically symmetric um, molecular orbital. And um, that is going to have a C infinity axis along the bond axis. When I subtract them, I also get a spherically symmetric distribution um, around the Z axis but there is a node between the two nuclei. So when I rotate about that bond axis, I have a C infinity symmetry. Those orbitals are going to be um, a particular type of orbital called a sigma molecular orbital. If I look at the 2s on atom A with the 2pz on atom B, I can see that I again have this sort of um, symmetric about the bond axis um, type of orbital. And there is no node between the two nuclei when I add those, and so that's a bonding orbital. There is a little bit of electron density on the other side of the B atom because of the P orbital having that electron density. But if I rotate about the bond axis, I'm still gonna get that C infinity symmetry for both the plus and the minus, the bonding and anti-bonding. Same thing's gonna happen when I look at the PZ minus PZ or the PZ plus PZ. Again, I'm gonna have that spherical symmetry along the bond axis. And in the um, subtracted case, I don't have a node, but in the when I add them, I get a node between the two nuclei. So the addition is an anti-bonding, but the subtraction is a bonding but I'm still gonna have that C infinity symmetry when I look at rotation along the bond axis. Now, when I look at PX and P um, plus PX or PY plus PY, same thing, I'm going to end up with electron density above and below the plane of the bond axis. And so now when I rotate that um, molecular orbital about the bond axis, I'm going to have C2 symmetry because one lobe is positive and the other is negative. And so if I go a half a circle, I get I switch the plus and the minus signs, and so then I have C2 symmetry about that. So I have to rotate it um, a half a circle and then a half a circle again to get back to where I started. The same is going to be true of the anti-bonding orbital um, for the subtraction of px with px or the subtraction of py with py. The difference here is that I have a node 
between the two axes, but I'm still thinking about rotation about the bond axis. And when I do that, plus becomes minus and minus becomes plus in um, all cases. So these um, orbitals that have C infinity symmetry are sigma orbitals, and the orbitals that have C2 symmetry are called pi orbitals.